Let's get to it. So navigating regulatory maze. This has a DPC focus because that's my slant, but hopefully it will apply to almost everybody in this room who's considering private medicine. So the outline for the talk. We'll go over a definition of direct primary care, which is often confused with uh, concierge if you're talking to folks who've not researched it on their own. And we'll go over state regulations, which we'll, which we'll spend a considerable time on because that's where the, most of the definitions are found. Look at federal regulations and hurdles that might be in the way, and then uh, compare various practice designs. So, the three-part definition, we made it as concise as we could at the Direct Primary Care Coalition, looking at around 14 or so state laws and also uh, some federal legislation that's out there, and this is kind of what the consensus definition is these days. So it charges a periodic fee for services, that's typically a once a month fee, does not bill any third parties on a fee for service basis, not for the DPC patients at least, and then any per visit charge must be less than the monthly equivalent of the periodic fee. And the third one's usually what has people scratching their heads. And the intent there is, uh, hypothetically, you could come up with a practice design where you said, oh, I charge you $10 a month, and I charge you $100 a visit. That's different, um, but it's more of a cash pay urgent care probably than family medicine. So that's why we wrote it this way. And that kind of model would not get you unwanted attention from a state insurance commissioner which is also the main reason for this definition is to protect physicians from unwanted intrusions from state insurance commissioners. So you gotta contrast that with the fee for non-covered services model, which is most, what most people refer to as concierge. I consider it a dangerous legal game for lots of reasons. Dr. Huntoon just pointed out a lot of problems when you decide not to opt out of Medicare, various things apply to you. And those, the biggest thing out there really is the False Claims Act. Uh, damages are very, very high if you've done any false billing whatsoever, and of course Stark laws apply as well. Uh, but never mind those issues, you have IR overhead. And you're going to have to ask yourself to treat some patients better than others. If you're in the 20% group that has signed up for concierge, then you get more time for an appointment than everybody else. Do you really want to, do you really want to force yourself to be in that situation? Uh, so occasionally some DPC physicians will say, well, I want to take Medicare patients in my practice, but I don't want to opt out because I need a moonlight and be in Medicare in this other setting, so why don't I design my practice this way? And I tell them that you can, but you open yourself up to the legal risks highlighted above, and unless you're trying to design your entire membership to be non-covered services for all your patients, um, then if I'm, if I'm the plaintiff's attorney on the government side, I'm going to argue that your non-covered services model isn't much different from your covered services model, and therefore it's a bit of a facade, and use that to pierce, to pierce the entire operation. So pricing structures. Uh, I already spilled the beans here a little bit on periodic fee. You could have monthly, quarterly, yearly. Most folks do monthly. You could have in arrears, meaning after the fact or prepaid. Uh, I generally recommend um, in arrears rather than prepaid because most states don't have DPC law in the books. In fact, as we'll see later, there's only 14 that have it. About 10 of those are helpful, the other four are really not so much. And uh, unless you've got this clarification, this is often one of the things insurance commissioners will use to come after your practice. So that's one of about 10 things you can do to try and reduce your insurance risk is bill on arrears. Uh, per visit fee, about 25% of direct primary care practices across the country do some sort of per visit fee, usually around 25 to $30. Uh, not something substantial, it's done out of a partial fear that if they don't do that, that patients will visit the practice a little too often. Um, I can tell you that, uh, at least anecdotally so far, the average number of visits per year seems to be around four, regardless of whether or not you're charging a per visit fee or not, and most people don't find the need to do that. Insurance commissioners like it when you charge a per visit fee, because then they're less concerned about your risk. Uh, uh, we'll also talk, uh, lab bundling is sometimes done as well, so some practices will bundle, uh, you know, commonly ordered labs, CMP, CBC, TSH, that kind of thing, into a per visit fee type situation to try and simplify things. Uh, enrollment fees are typically used to discourage folks from signing up for DPC and then stopping two months later, because as any DPC doc will tell you, a lot of your work is done when the patient first signs up. Generally speaking, people who are perfectly healthy are not the first to rush in and and want this type of thing, so you often have an uncontrolled diabetic or some sort of autoimmune condition that you need to straighten away. Uh, and so they use enrollment fees, or better yet, uh, re-enrollment fees as deterrents to drop out. Interestingly enough, only 25% of practices do this as well. So, the business of insurance. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, state insurance commissioners will argue that DPC is too much risk 
uh, they'll say, well, what if you sign up 2,000 patients and 100 of them want to see you on Monday and you can't get them all in? You, you're, you're an unlawful insurance company and I'm going to regulate you and shut you down. Uh, this is what happened to Vic Wood, who was a DO, graduate of my school up in Wheeling, West Virginia, probably about 20 years ago. And uh, he had a practice that he was seeing a lot of uninsured patients who couldn't afford things. He'd not heard of DPC. He didn't know anything about this and sort of dreamt it up, kind of at the same time that Garrison Bliss was doing things in Washington State and Brian Forrest was starting things in North Carolina. To my knowledge, they hadn't really crossed paths at that point, but everybody was trying their own thing. So he does this and gets a nasty knock on his door from the insurance commissioner saying, you can't do this anymore. Uh, he had to stop advertising. They didn't make him stop the plan because I think his patients would have gone berserk. Uh, so he had to lobby with the legislature for around three years and finally got a very, very narrow exception passed, which we can go over a little bit later, about uh, direct primary care in West Virginia. Um, for those looking in the legal literature, there's really no case law directly on point on this argument that the insurance commissioners make. The closest thing out there is Huff v. St. Joseph's Mercy Hospital, which was a prepaid obstetrics plan that the hospital offered in the 70s, where they basically said, if you meet X, Y, and Z criteria and we expect your delivery to be fairly standard, you pay us this amount, uh, you know, $2,000 or whatever it was up front, and you won't expect any more additional charges unless there's some sort of complication from the pregnancy. So. Uh, they won their case, so at least it's slightly good persuasive pre precedent on our side. That was out of Iowa, if I recall correctly. Um, so scope is an important component of this as well. To the extent you narrow your own scope based on what you do or don't want to do in your contract, then it makes the insurance commissioner less concerned too. If I write in my contract that even though I'm a family physician, I also plan to do uh, colonoscopies and maybe even open heart surgery on Fridays, that's going to get a lot of unwanted attention because you're promising things that are well beyond your traditional scope. Uh, theoretically, if you move 50 physicians into your practice and you have every internal medicine specialty and start doing these, this, that, and the other, then you start to look more like Kaiser. And then their argument that you're an insurance company is more valid. So each state has approached this issue a little bit differently. Uh, the 14 states with laws are listed there. Well, I've got a map that shows those a little better later. Okay, uh, scope of practice. So. Hopefully you define this yourself in your own contract. The other places you can expect to see it defined is sometimes in state law, ideally not, but sometimes. And then also uh, we've got some health HSA legislation at the federal level that's being pushed around. And uh, by nature, when you just say what, uh, when something has special tax status, you have to define what that something is. There's some DPC physicians out there that work uh, various things you might not expect into the membership fee. Sometimes that might be massage therapy. Um, and so I would expect that if the IRS were to come in and give us some sort of HSA recognition, that they would carve out certain things like that. Okay. And so location, location, location. There's 402 DPC practices across 45 states. It is uh, possible everywhere, but some states make it more difficult than others. Um, and that's where I've, some things in the Best State to Practice Medicine article kind of cover some of these issues. Uh, <clears throat> Price transparency is important. The more you have that in the region, the easier it is for your DPC practice to negotiate cash prices. If I'm trying to do this in North Carolina where there's all kinds of DPC practices and I call up a radiology group, they're more likely to just give me a cash price for a chest x-ray. Uh, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, that's not the case. You have to do a little more talking, a little more educating to, to get cash prices in the first place. There are several states, I've highlighted them there, where in-office dispensing is especially problematic. Four of those are much harsher than the others. Off the top of my head, the two that surprised me the most were Texas and Utah. If you want to do in-office dispensing there, forget it. Uh, there's no way to do it. Um, and that's a big value add if anybody's followed uh, Josh of Atlas MD. He, he preaches about that all the time, and it's very popular among patients. Uh, other regulations that can get in the way, uh, several states have pathology direct billing laws. Um, sort of ironic title since it's a problem for DBC. But what they try to say is that the Physician's practice is not allowed to bill, the pathology, bill for the pathology services. So to give you an example, typically the way this works is if, if you've negotiated the price of a head CT to be $400 with a local radiology group, part of the reason the radiology group will give you that price is because they don't have the burden of collecting the money from the patient. You're paying them. When you send the patient there, you're paying them. Now, if you're doing things right, the patient's paying you at exactly the same time at exactly the same price, okay? It's all price transparent along the whole way. In pathology, they don't like that because historically there was some abuse there where maybe I did a skin biopsy or a special test 
and the lab's giving me a rate of $50 and I'm charging the patient $100. So in a lot of states, they tried to prohibit any direct billing from the practice for, for pathology services. So you ideally want to be in a state where, uh, for example, I, I can use a lab out of Idaho that's about $42 a specimen. But that price is charged to me, and then I have to turn around and charge that to the patient again. Okay, practice distribution. So the darker they are, the more DBC practices in the state, and the uh, number is over there to the right. Uh, that's not, I should, I should clarify, that's not necessarily the number of practices so much as the number of clinics. Some are larger, like Key Alliance up in Washington. They've got uh, somewhere between 20 and 40,000 of their own patients across around five or six clinics. <coughs> So as you can see, there are certain hot spots in the country. And then they don't necessarily correlate with the states that actually have direct primary care law in the books. Uh, the, the good ones are in green. The uh, ones that really don't do much for you are in yellow. And then the bad guys are in red. Uh, blue, I can tell you, um, Florida, where we're at right now, Lee Gross has done a lot of pushing on DPC law here. So if you want the updates about the, that chance of passage, I'd be in touch with him. He's of Epiphany Healthcare. Uh, Wyoming, I can tell you we've got a very good chance that will pass in this legislative session in February. Also, Virginia has a good chance, and the rest of them I'm not quite sure. So if you are going to make some sort of state policy effort, um, start with some sort of model legislation. Do a lot of educating on what DPC is. You don't want to wind up with a disaster like what happened in Montana that we'll cover a little bit later. Um, there are good state law examples out there. A lot of people look to Washington because they got a lot of press, but it does have its share of uh, problems, so I don't think it's the best example. Oklahoma and Idaho are better examples. Uh, the biggest problem with Washington's legislation was they still gave the insurance commissioner a chance to audit your practice, but when you signed up for this DPC uh, uh, list that they make you sign up for. So uh, don't try and go it alone. Um, and uh, that's, that was Vic Wood's problem in West Virginia. He had to do everything by himself, and uh, they carved in a narrow little exception in what they call a pilot program, which is problematic. So here's West Virginia. They call it a preventive care pilot program, because at the time, I believe it was around 2005 or so, DPC wasn't a common term. So they initially limited it to six sites. It's expiring, and they keep gradually renewing it, even though nobody else is signing up for it. And there's good reasons why nobody's signing up for it. They have a health care authority, which is basically their certificate of need body. And you have to report to these guys on all kinds of things. They have to approve your marketing. They have to approve your prices. Uh, they still get to control where you do and don't advertise. I can't throw up a billboard. Why not? Because somebody who doesn't have a high deductible plan might see it. I'm only allowed to advertise if I know you have a high deductible plan with a deductible of three grand or greater. So you have absurd things like this on the books that are sort of hampering DPC. If I were practicing DPC in West Virginia, I would not uh, file with this body. I would fully expect, if the insurance commissioner wants to be aggressive, to be a lawsuit, and then I'd just look for precedent. Because this is too restrictive to, to uh, really do it the right way. Um, mandatory six-month wait for an employer who decides to purchase DPC for his employees. Now, that's been one of the few things, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of the Affordable Care Act, but... It has made people pay attention to price more, and that includes employers. And there has been a trend toward employers having self-insured plans. And when people self-insure with stop loss and they see all these prices up front, they come looking for DPC practices once they learn they're an option. And the idea that an employer would make this decision and then you'd have to say, oh, we can do this, but wait six months. That's one more problem. So a lot of concerns with that legislation. Oklahoma was a good example. Uh, they clearly defined DPC, they said it's not insurance, not subject to regulation by any insurance department. Um, and I'll let you guys read that later, it's, it's uh, very good. Arkansas, if you look into it, they actually didn't use the phrase DPC much. They used the phrase concierge, which kind of just, you know, right off the bat tells you they weren't thinking of this appropriately. Because concierge practices, they do double dipping, where you have that fee-for-service on top of it. So they never got unwanted attention from the insurance commissioner. But Arkansas wrote it as though it was concierge and then did the same thing Arizona did, which was they included a phrase right here at the end of this Montana slide, which punches a hole in the entire legislation. So they said, basically this is the same phrase, so we, just, we can just read it real quick. This code does not apply to direct primary care provider plans established pursuant to blah, 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 if the plan does not assume financial risk. Well, that was the whole debate in the first place with the insurance commissioner was rather not this plan assume financial risk. So the minute you throw that phrase in there, you might, might as well not have written the law. 
And that's in Arizona. Uh, that's in, that was in Montana's proposal, and I believe that's in Arkansas as well. So not only did they not define things appropriately, but they had um, junk like that in there. Um, Montana was a real mess. Um, so this was, they didn't contact anybody that I know anywhere in the direct primary care community, um, not the coalition, not any direct primary care physicians. Um, they wrote it to require board certification, so they decided to, to get in that mess as well. Uh, they defined chiropractors as primary care. They confused mandatory disclosure provisions and other problems about double dipping. Um, and it passed. It was very partisan. I think it was all, all Republicans voted for, all Democrats voted against. And then the Democrat governor vetoed it and went on to say statements like this. So uh, basically bashing direct primary care, indicating he doesn't know what it is. So it was this real comedy of errors where I'm glad it was vetoed, but it was vetoed for totally the wrong reasons. Uh, so uh, once we get past the state law issues, how do you uh, be careful about establishing a patient relationship? This is one of the most common pitfalls I see in DPC practices. So a lot of uh, vendors out there will help you sign up patients, and they'll say, well, have them do online sign up. And then that day you get them to give you a credit card and then immediately you're charging the patient and there's no lost revenue and that's great for you. And that sounds wonderful, but the problem is if you take the money, then you start a patient relationship. And if they show up expecting you to prescribe methadone and they've been paying you for three months, now you've got a problem. So I don't recommend just taking that right off the bat. I think you can have them sign up and do any number of things uh, initially, but uh, don't start taking payment until it's clear to you this is a relationship that both of you want. Uh, and then in general, just uh, watch it when it comes to narcotics, uh, DPC, or any type of cash pay model means you're a DEA target. Okay, and when you're discontinuing care, look to your state's laws there. Um, some state DPC legislation does discuss this as well, and I've got some examples later out of Washington, Louisiana, and Mississippi. <clears throat> um, so here those are. They provide that if the patient participates in any fraudulent activity, fails to pay for services, is abusive physically or emotionally, doesn't adhere to a treatment plan, which physicians really get excited about, uh, or uh, d practice simply discontinues DPC operations, then that's all a reasonable basis for discontinuing care. And this is fairly intuitive for any physician, but when it comes to uh, legislatures and policymakers that don't practice medicine, this is really helpful to put in there. Traditional insurance. Uh, I don't recommend you sign any traditional insurance party th third party contracts, largely because if you're really spending most of your time in DPC, you just don't need these things. But beyond that, if you sign them willy nilly and then think, oh, I'm just going to quit and launch my own direct primary care practice, they might be able to come in and shut you down. How do they do that? Because you're in breach of the contract when you privately contract with the Blue Cross Blue Shield patient that you promised you would take fee for service payments for. So if you are under a traditional insurance agreement, you either need to write in your own clause at the end having something to, to the effect of saying this does not apply to patients with which I privately contract in my office, if they're unwilling to sign that, then you leave the agreement with the 90-day out clause or whatever they have and, and pay attention to that procedure. We did have a DPC physician who did have to temporarily shutter her operations over this very issue. So uh, always have patients sign individual contracts with you. That sounds fairly intuitive. But if you're a large group like Key Alliance and you had a big employer like that had 2,000, 3,000 patients, then uh, you don't want to have, uh, have the employer just lump all these patients on you and then not sign a contract with them. Because then you change the selected marriage of DPC into an arranged marriage of capitation where nobody's happy. So you've got to be careful and always make sure your patient has the ability to fire you if they don't like you. Okay. Uh, state legislative summary. Things that you want, a clean definition of DPC, uh, not insurance protection, not insurance mandatory disclosures, double, dip, double dipping fee for service prohibitions. Those all help clarify what it is. And quite frankly, they make things nicer in the concierge group as well. Because when you've got laws like Oregon that poorly define things, they wind up requiring registration from both DPC and concierge groups when the concierge group should have never been subjected to any of this anyway because they didn't have business of insurance risk. Okay, federal regulations. The, well, the three at the top will spend the most time on Medicare, the Affordable Care Act, and health savings accounts. Medicare, uh, Dr. Huntoon already covered this very well, that you want to opt out if at all possible. You either, if you want to see a Medicare patient in the DPC setting, your choices are to either opt out so that you can privately contract with them, arrange a fee for non-covered services agreement, which is what's typical in the concierge space, uh, or to operate a hybrid model like what Lee Gross does, 
where he'll have his DPC operations open to everybody but his Medicare patients and then continue to see Medicare patients in the fee service setting. Okay, and uh, I'll leave the rest of that there. Moonlighting is always a common question when it comes to opting out of Medicare. People want to know if I jump into the pool, where else can I swim to? You can work in the urgent care or the emergency room, even if they are covered by Medicare, because we have an exception for that. There's a separate code they can use to bill in those settings. Uh, you can do cash pay telemedicine. You can do correctional medicine, which is what I found. I like to say I found freedom in prison. Freedom from Medicare, that is. Um, and you can work in the occupational medicine space. That's typically uh, off also under state law, and it's an entirely separate billing system. Uh, for those looking on the details of the urgent care or emergency care exception, I've written it all in, and that's in your handout there as well. So if you talk to your local ER and they think you're crazy, this is the citation you can give them, okay? You've even got a code down there for them, too. What does the Affordable Care Act say about direct primary care? Uh, section 10104 says that HHS shall permit a qualified direct primary care health plan to provide coverage through a qualified direct primary care medical home plan that meets criteria established by the Secretary. So obviously the words in red will get everybody's attention. And what do those really mean? Um, first I threw this in there. Free markets will find a way. If you use DPC and the, this provision in the ACA, you can kind of punch a hole in the ACA. So qualified health plans, this is what that is. So these, these 10 requirements are what has to be offered in an insurance plan for it to be uh, legal under Obamacare and meet your requirements. The things I've highlighted in green are places that you get to say to the patient or to the employer, to whoever you're speaking to about direct primary care, that these are where I can make a difference for you as a DPC physician. And based on that theory, you can carve them out. So if I'm, in, if I'm Blue Cross Blue Shield and I finally decide that I like direct primary care, I'm allowed to design an insurance plan that specifically does not cover ambulatory patient services and does not cover preventive wellness services and would presume reductions in other areas. Now, I'm allowed to sell that plan on the exchange if it is paired with a DPC practice. They have to be paired together, bundled side by side with a price point that looks equivalent to everything else in the exchange. So this has not been done to its purest form yet, uh, mainly because DPC has not reached critical mass in any area for people to develop this plan. But as anybody in the room can immediately surmise, this should be the cheapest thing on the exchange should they eventually be offered. So federal HHS rules, these are also in your packet, more for you to read later. Um, the nice thing to note there, when they say consistent with the program in Washington, they're not referencing themselves, they're referencing Washington State which winds up giving that state law a little more uh, credence than others in the sense that the, the Affordable Care Act refers to it directly. So all this language saying uh, basically this is not insurance at various levels, and that includes at the federal level, and in spite of these things, which I can take questions on, but I'll let you read on your own, we still have a health savings account problem where the IRS says you can't sign up for a DPC plan or excuse me, I'll rephrase, you cannot use DPC uh, if you plan to use an HSA, is the easiest way to phrase it. So they view direct primary care as either an impermissible gap plan, okay, or a second health plan. So in other words, if I'm going to buy an HSA, I have to have a qualified high deductible plan. Otherwise, I'm not allowed to purchase it. I think the number is five grand that they might have picked, four grand, something like that. They had some cutoff where you had to be above that or you can't buy an HSA. And they say, DPC lands you somewhere between, so now your deductible, your high deductible plan that you think you have, we don't think you have that. We think you have something less than that. Maybe your deductible is equivalent to two or one grand because you bought DPC services. So that creates two problems. One, they would argue that you can't use DPC funding to pay the periodic fee. And two, they would argue the very nature of your being enrolled in a DPC practice means you can't contribute to an HSA. Now, if you already have one, you shouldn't necessarily have to close it, but they would argue you can't continue to contribute to it. Um, hypothetically, you could open an HSA on January 1st, sign up for DPC on January 2nd, and then use you know, the HSA funds to pay for any ancillary fees that are done on a fee-for-service basis, such as labs and radiologic add-ons and that kind of thing. But uh, it's obviously a large regulatory hurdle right now, as written. The IRS has said that they are unlikely to litigate this, and uh, all, over the, all over the country, people are indeed using HSAs for DPC services, although I can't recommend that. 
Primary Care Enhancement Act was proposed to try and deal with some of these problems. Um, it was designed to uh, fix, the, to clarify the HSA issue, and it also created a Medicare pilot, which everybody in this room might sort of cringe, but uh, the way it was written, it would not force the physician to change their opt-out status. So we pointed out to the authors of this legislation, look, if you write something trying to allow Medicare to pay for DPC services, your problem is going to be that most of the DPC physicians across the country aren't treating that group of patients or, in order to treat them, has already opted out. So the easiest way to think of it is it had an exception written in such that you could either be in Medicare the way you always were and see these patients, or you could be opted out and you'd have a similar exception in that setting just like you would the emergency department or the urgent care. Okay, uh, if employers talk about being interested in your direct primary care practice, how should you approach this? First, find out if they self-insure with stop loss. Now, how many people in the room are familiar with what that means? Good, okay. For, for those who haven't heard of it, basically if you're large enough, maybe you've got 100 employees and you say, you know what, we can take a $250,000 loss and it's not going to put us under. For the first $250,000 in claims, I'm just going to pay those directly out of pocket. And then for anything above that, I want Blue Cross or whoever to come in and take over the rest. And I'll go ahead and use your network for prices below that rate. So these folks pay attention to price because they're paying every dime of it most of the time. And because they're paying it, they actually have access to the data. So when you save them money using direct primary care, they actually see it. Uh, if somebody's using traditional insurance, just bought it in bulk, wasn't using stop loss, they pretty much have to trust that the nice insurance company is going to lower their rates when their utilization went down. So the, the biggest group for this by far is folks who self-insure. Smaller employers may well be using health sharing ministries, which uh, I'm sure you've heard about in other settings. Okay. Uh, other options if these two things don't work, basically you want patients to be as price sensitive as possible, which usually means buying the highest deductible bronze plan on the market, since you can't actually buy the wrap plan that we discussed earlier, which hasn't really been built anywhere yet. Okay. So top three legal advis advisements, make sure you consider the business of insurance rules when you're selecting your state to practice. Look up your insurance code if they're not one of the 14 with some sort of law in the books that you can reference. Uh, please do opt out of Medicare if you want to do a pure DPC practice. It will make your life much easier. And uh, do go all in. I think the practices that don't work wind up creating a hybrid when they didn't mean to. And they say, well, we'll stop the insurance, we'll stop one insurance, and we'll gradually add direct primary care patients. And the problem is your overhead never do drops down enough. Your legal risk never drops down enough either. And your price points aren't low enough to make the practice successful. And you quickly declare failure when I would argue you never gave it a chance. Um, there's a little bit of recommended reading and uh, a few upcoming events also in the packet. If you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer them by email. And uh, thank you.